So, a uh, very good evening to all participants. Welcome to this uh, NPTEL Week Three Live TA session once again uh, for the course Cell Culture Technologies. I am your TA for this session. My name is Ankita De, and I host this session every week on Tuesdays, six to seven p. Um, sorry, seven to eight p.m. So, as already discussed in the previous sessions, this is a live interactive one-hour video session during which we solve some previous year's assignment questions that help you in solving this year's uh, weekly assignment questions. Uh, towards the end. We have a Q and A segment where you can ask me your questions by posting them in the chat box, and I will try to answer them. In the end, we'll also provide you with the course materials and the necessary uh, PowerPoint slides and the class recordings for your access later. So um, let's get started. So before we move on to uh, discussing the questions, uh, let's recapitulate a few key points that were discussed in this year's uh, in this year's the week three NPTEL video lectures. So in this week's NPTEL lecture, uh, Professor Das had discussed about the following key points. So the first one is the positioning of the cell culture equipment. So this is a very important point. So uh, while designing our lab, so we need to keep this. Thing in mind while this uh, while designing our lab that how and where we need to place our cell culture equipment. So uh, if you remember that we had discussed in our previous uh, class that uh, the cell culture lab or the the cell culture facility is actually uh, the is separated from the main lab that you have is uh, separated with the help of glass walls. So. Oh, or 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 any kind of partition. It could be any kind of partition. So before entering the core facility, so the the core facility is actually separated from the rest of the lab. Uh, so and you need to enter it uh, through separate rooms. So the first room that is to enter into the first door will lead into lead you into the first room where you uh, will find all kinds of. Uh, Say you will have the uh, uh, the necessary things that you need to uh, sanitize yourself. That is, you will have the sink at one place where you need to wash your hands, and then you need to put on the correct attire that you uh, need to need to wear while working inside the cell culture lab. Such as the uh, you need to wear uh, the gloves, you need to wear your mask, you need to wear your head cap, and then you have the apron. So these are the things that you need to wear while working inside the lab. So Uh, once you enter into the first room, so this room is uh, so the door is actually guarded with the help of a wind curtain. So this wind curtain will ensure that the outside air does not enter into the inside. And then when you enter into the core facility, this core facility will have a sliding door. That is, it won't have uh, like unlike the first door that you used to enter the lab, it won't have a uh, door which a wind curtain, but instead it will have a sliding door. So here we have a sliding door to ensure that there is minimum air current uh, flowing into the main room or that is the core facility room. And outside this door, you will have a sticky mat placed. So these sticky mats will ensure that they will um, attract any kind of incoming dust particles. So then once you en have entered into the core facility, Uh, one thing that you must keep in mind is that uh, the essential components, that is your bio safety cabinet or the uh, laminar flow hood inside which you perform all the cell culture activities, should not be placed in direct line with the incoming air current. So, the bio safety cabinet or the incubator, these are the essential, is the important uh, components inside the core facility of a cell culture lab. So you must make sure that uh, to to make sure that there is minimum contamination coming in, or, or the, that your cells are uh, not uh, prone to the risk of contamination. You must ensure that they are placed in a way that uh, they are not coming in direct line with the outside air. So they must be placed as far away from the doors as possible. Um, so the next. a uh, thing that we must keep in mind while setting up the lab is to make efficient utilization of the available space so uh, as we were discussing in the previous uh, the previous session that uh, that if you uh, that we have several equipments inside the lab so uh, some of them as we as i was saying that uh, the bio safety cabinet then we have the 
then we have the incubator and then we have a water bath then we have the different refrigerators so we have the refrigerators at 4 degree minus 80 degree and uh, Uh, so and then we also have the uh, a bench top where we keep our microscope then we have a centrifuge so you make you need to make space for each one of these components so uh, one thing that we must make sure that uh, that while setting up a lab so if you are a beginner who is uh, just beginning to uh, set up his lab so uh, so a few things that you need to keep in mind is that you need to keep adequate amount of space empty so that uh, in the future when you are deciding to uh, expand say you uh, wish to buy some more equipments that you didn't have available at the time at the setting up of the lab so you have adequate space to accommodate them so for that purpose you need to make sure that you have adequate amount of space available uh, to accommodate any incoming equipments that you might buy in the future so you might have a, you should have a vision that how you are how you are uh, willing to expand your lab in the future and make provision for that uh the next thing that we were saying that the microscope so in this week's lecture we had discussed about the different kind of microscopes that could be used inside the in in the cell culture lab so uh um, so the different kind of microscopes as you might have you might already know uh, the one kind of microscope that we use is a bright field light microscope so this is a uh, compound microscope a uh, compound microscope is essentially different from a light microscope in in that that it has two lenses so here we see that it has an objective lens which magnifies the image placed on the stage so this is the stage where we uh, place the specimen so this is an objective lens which will magnify uh, the image and uh, it will produce a real image and then we have the eyepiece lens which is the second lens this will magnify uh, magnify the image further the real image further and will produce a virtual image so uh, the compound microscope is a Uh, has several advantages that is it uses its own source of light so the uh, light comes from here so we have a condenser which will uh, uh, focus the light on the stage and we uh, so it has its own source of light and also it is easy to handle so generally schools and colleges use it and also it is a bit less expensive than the uh, this microscope which is the phase contrast microscope so in our cell culture lab we use this microscope that is our cell culture uh, that is our phase contrast microscope now how is the phase contrast microscope different from a bright field a light microscope that is the compound microscope so the phase contrast microscope is uh, used to visualize cellular structures which are um, essentially invisible with a bright field microscope so uh, with the help of this phase contrast microscope one can see uh, structures that uh, could be visualized only after staining and would require the depth of the cells and a uh, few additional preparation steps to visualize the cells that is uh, with the help of a, a compound microscope you could not visualize live cells and their life mo morphology or other cellular structures so to visualize them in a live condition that is inside the live cells without the need for additional uh, staining or preparation you could watch them under this phase contrast microscope Uh, so the principle behind the working of a phase contrast microscope is that it uh, converts uh, shifts in phases of light which passes through the uh, specimen um, with any kind of specimen other than vacuum to change to changes in brightness in the image so the changes in brightness uh, arise from the scattering and absorption of the light so this is essentially the principle behind the working of a phase contrast microscope and it is more expensive than a normal compound microscope and this is the kind of microscope that we use in our cell culture lab uh the next thing that we had discussed about is about maintaining the right kind of osmolarity of the medium in which we are culturing our cells uh so osmolarity basically refers to the uh, total number of solutes that uh, is present in a in per liter of a solvent so uh, it is uh, so our inside our body so our body uh, inside our body each cell or the each cell is exposed to different kind of osmolarity condition so our extracellular environment it has uh, or it maintains uh, an osmolarity condition of about say uh, 230 to 280 uh, uh, say, sorry 280 to 320 milliosmol so this is the uh, kind of uh, this is the range of 
osmolarity condition that is maintained inside our body so most of the cells are need to be cultured in an osmolarity condition outside our body in a medium that is that will essentially mimic the uh, osmolarity conditions uh, inside our body so for that you need to have you need to culture your cells in the appropriate medium and uh, one equipment that measures the osmolarity of a of a medium is the osmometer uh, the next thing that we had talked about is the ph meter so the ph meter is uh, also another important component that you must have so it is a uh, it is required while you are preparing your media so if you are uh, say using a uh, powdered media in your lab that is a uh, powdered media comes in pouch packet so what you need to do is uh, if, it, if it is a powdered media that is you are, that is uh, you are using say if it is a dmem uh, media so for uh, for that what you need to do you need to uh, dissolve it in a specific in a volume of water and then you need to adjust the ph so after uh, so uh, after you have dissolved this powdered media in a specific volume of water say 1 liter of water and it's mentioned in the uh, packet itself that how much uh, amount of what components you need to mix suppose you need to be mix with it uh, sodium bicarbonate so as i was discussing in the previous class that sodium bicarbonate is added and it acts as a it helps to maintain the buffer system inside the cell it helps to maintain the proper ph so uh, this carbon uh, the sodium bicarbonate that we add in our medium this is a uh, say uh, for dmem that we use we add 3.7 gram of sodium bicarbonate to the media per liter of water that we use uh, so for that what you need after adding the sodium bicarbonate we need to measure the ph of the medium so and then we need to adjust the ph accordingly so uh, the th uh, so what we do on our, in our lab is that we adjust the ph of the medium that we have prepared after dissolving the powder and after having added sodium bicarbonate we adjust the ph uh, to roughly 7.2 because uh, then after we have we add fps it is believed that the ph will rise by 0.2 more so then it will somewhat maintain the physiological ph at 7.4 so it is very important that you have a ph meter in your lab that will maintain the correct ph uh, the next thing that we have talked about is a water bath so uh, the water bath is uh, that we use in our cell culture is maintained at 37 degree so it's used for various purposes first thing is that the media that we use so the media bottles uh, if they are not in use, that is after you have done with your work, we keep the media bottles inside the refrigerator, uh, say at about, which is uh, maintained at about 4 degrees centigrade. And so before you, uh, so after you take them out and you need them for your cell culture activity, that is uh, say you need to passage your cells or for some other activity. So you take the media bottles from out of the refrigerator, which is maintained at 4 degrees centigrade. And what you need to do is you need to, uh, warm the media media so for that we place the bottles inside the water bath which will uh, and then we keep it uh, inside uh, the water bath for about say 5 to 10 minutes and then it will be brought to the uh, ambient temperature that is the 37 degree centigrade because if you add the cold media to your cells that then your cells will experience a kind of osmotic shock and they might die so it is uh, advisable that you, before using the media, you put it in the water bath and bring it to 37 degrees centigrade and then you use it. Uh, the next thing that we use the water bath for is for thawing the cells. So as we were talking about that, uh, if, this, if you if you um, like take you are taking out your cells from long term storage, that is from your nitrogen storage tanks, which is maintained at below minus 130 degrees centigrade. So first thing that you need to do is you take the vial out and you need to take a uh, place into the water bath for a few seconds and then you need to wipe it with alcohol and then you can bring it into your laminar flow hood inside the laminar flow hood you will then uh, dilute the freezing media in which you had stored the cells with the help of uh, with the help of fresh medium and uh, say about 9 to 10 ml of media and then you will centrifuge it and then you will uh, then you will get the pellet of the cells and then you will reseed those cells in your fresh medium so uh, this is what we use in water bath for uh, or say any any uh, uh, chemicals that you're using so even trypsin so even trypsin we keep it at uh, zero degree if it is not in use and say in the at the morning when we are coming in our lab and we are starting with our work so we take our 
take the trypsin out and we then we bring it to the appropriate temperature we warm it to 37 degree uh, by placing into the water bath and then we use it um, the next thing that we had talked about uh, so is the clinostat so a uh, clinostat is basically a device which will uh, simulate microgravity conditions and it will uh, by rotating the cells and it will try to uh, simulate a kind of a situation where uh, a microgravity situation so we will talk about what it is and we will see how it functions uh, in the why we discuss the questions uh, next thing is biomems uh, biomems is also sometimes uh, uh, this term is also used sometimes unchangeably with the uh, lab on a chip device so we'll also see what biomems is uh, while we discuss the questions uh, the next thing that we uh, that we had discussed in this week's lecture is the uh, importance of maintaining hygiene in your cell culture lab. So uh, there are a few uh, things that you need to keep in mind while working in a cell culture lab. So this is also uh, one part that we had discussed in our previous session. That is the importance of maintaining our septic techniques in our lab. Uh, so few of them, uh, few of them would be as I was saying in the beginning of this session is that uh, like. Uh, before walking in uh, to your main coal, uh, core facility that you need to place uh, you need to have uh, two doors that will separate your core facility from the rest of the lab and then right outside the uh, door to the, the sliding door to your core facility you need to place sticky mats which will attract any kind of dust incoming dust particles also uh, you um, as we were saying that you need to remove your footwear uh, that you need to, uh, any outside footwear you need to leave it outside the outside the uh, cell culture room and inside the cell culture room you need to have a uh, dedicated footwear uh, so and if you remember professor das was discussing about this so you need to have dedicated footwear this is also something that we follow in our lab so you cannot wear this footwear outside you need to wear these footwear in only inside the cell culture lab and those have to, has to be uh, kept inside the lab uh, that, that is the, those have to be kept inside the core facility only uh, the next thing that is uh, we talked about is the importance of having a false roof. So uh, and uh, uh, provision of uh, having the air that is the air inside the cell culture room sucked out. For this we need to have a false roof and uh, uh, say which will hide all the kind of pumps or anything that will suck the uh, air out of the cell culture room and will keep the cell culture room air clean. The next thing that we had talked about is a uh, say the important we had also talked about uh, uh, keeping the biosafety cabinets how we must maintain the biosafety cabinet so uh, we must leave the biosafety cabinets switched on at all times except when you are not using them so uh, what we do is that when we come in uh, come into our lab that is in the morning we come and we switch on our, our uh, biosafety cabinet so we have two kinds of biosafety cabinets in our lab so one of them is a manual uh, that is you need to switch it on uh, and the other one is automated so for the automated one uh, it is switched on automatically that is the fan is uh, the blowers will switch on automatically once you lift the lid and the other one you have to uh, you have to operate it manually and you need to switch it on so what we do is when we uh, that in the morning we switch on our uh, our biosafety cabinets and after we have done with our work for the day uh, that is before leaving the lab we uh, will switch it off uh, so this is done to ensure that uh, um, to minimize contamination uh, contamination in your from uh, in your cells uh, the next thing that we talked about is uh, how we must maintain our, the incubators inside our lab so the incubators is uh, uh, the incubator we must have a specific you must have designated racks for each one of the uh, each one of the per person who is working in the lab so this done that say you have two incubators and you have uh, three to four racks in each so you must uh, specify which rack is being used by whom because uh, uh, because you don't know what others what kind of aseptic techniques others are following you are only sure of what kind of techniques you are using so it's very important that you separate your area inside the incubator because say someone is just beginning to uh, just uh, someone who has less experience in working with cell culture and say he, he or she might not be uh, 
uh, fully adept in using all this uh, in following all the cell culture techniques so maybe uh, there are chances that uh, uh, his or her cells might uh, be suffering from some kind of contamination because you know uh, this happens when you begin with uh, your cell culture because when you're a beginner in a lab so what you need to do is you need to separate your rack so that you know, there are less chances of contamination from others flasks or other uh, uh, culture plates uh the next thing is that uh, the incubators must be kept very clean and once a week you must uh clean the incubator with 70% alcohol you must wipe the surface with 70% alcohol also uh, at the uh, at the door of the incubator there are certain indicators so they will indicate the the percentage of carbon dioxide that is uh be present inside the incubator also it will indicate the water level so you need to check them from time to time that your uh that your incubator is maintained at the right kind of uh, uh humidity and temperature and uh, carbon dioxide concentration this is also true for your water bath uh, so the water bath also the water needs to be changed every week so otherwise they might observe some kind of fungal growth inside your water bath and for that purpose you need to change the water every week so it's a must uh the next thing that we talk about is uh the so uh the importance of wearing the right kind of attire so as i was discussing you must wear the proper uh uniform like the lab coat and the gloves and the masks uh, so say uh, if you are unwell then it's advisable that you don't work in the lab because uh, you know you might be unwell and then you might uh, might be spreading uh, contamination in the lab so that is advisable that you don't come to your cell culture facility or you postpone your work uh, if you are unwell uh the next thing that we talked about is the importance of having a uh, backup so the co2 cylinders that are con uh, connected to your incubators you must check from time to time how much residual co2 is present in them because you know um, say uh, a weekend is approaching and you uh, see that uh, and no one saw that how much co2 was left in your cylinders and suddenly no one is coming no one is coming to the lab on those weekends and your co2 level goes drops down and uh, your cells die because uh, that will be a very very um, hazardous situation for your cells all your cells will die so it's important that you check from time to time uh, the carbon dioxide concentration uh, of your uh, incubator and also the amount of carbon dioxide present inside the co2 cylinder and uh, after and you must always have a backup so uh you it is important that you always have a backup uh, co2 cylinder in your lab and the next thing is the uh, importance of having a qps facility uh so as you are aware that in india uh, we often face power uh, face power outages so for that purpose you need to have a uh, designated qps facilities for each of your important uh, uh, equipments that is your say the the minus 80 degree freezer or you say uh, or the incubator so so uh, these are the things that you need to have an a proper ups facility for so that was all for maintaining the hy uh, um, hygienic environment next we had talked about the uh, interaction of cells with the polycarbonate surface so how cells essentially attach to the surface of a, a tissue culture flask or plate so uh, that is all that we had uh, talked about in our uh, this week's lecture now we'll move on to discussing the questions so this is question number 1 uh, what is 20 in t20 flask so we have four options here length of the flask top height of flask side area of flask base or volume of the entire flask so uh, what do uh, this is question reads that uh, what does the 20 in t20 flask refer to so is it the length of the flask top or the height of the flask side or the area of the flask base or the volume of the entire flask so uh, you might write your answers in the uh, chat box and we'll see what the right answer is uh so a couple of you are saying that the right answer is uh, option number c that is the area of the flask base okay so uh, we'll see what the right answer is yes so the right answer is the 
area of the flask base. So this is how your cell culture flask looks like and the 20 in the T20 flask essentially refers to the surface that is the surface of the flask it is a uh, 20 units so we will uh, discuss what uh, this unit is uh, in the in our next question so uh, as for this question uh, option c is the right answer that 20 in t20 flask refers to the area of the flask base so uh, moving on to question number 2 this link to question number 1 that is based on question number 1 the dimension 20 in t20 is meter millimeter centimeter square or cubic decimeter so uh, what does the, uh, the 20 in t20 flask uh, that is the 20 refer to that is what is the unit is it meter is it millimeter is it centimeter square or is it cubic decimeter so we have discussed that it refers to the area of the flask so it uh, cannot be meter or millimeter because both of these are units of length so it has to be either c or d either it is centimeter square it is sorry uh, either it has so it is has to be uh, option c because cubic decimeter will refer to the volume so uh, that way it is a very easy question so we will see what the right answer is it is centimeter square so your um, culture flasks that you use so the uh, say they, they so they come in different sizes so uh, different companies will uh, manufacture the flasks in different sizes but somewhat they uh, appear like this so we have a, a flask uh, like uh, with a cap like this and it looks like this somewhat and will, it will come in different sizes so this is a t12.5 uh, then we have the t25 flask t75 flask and then you have the t182 so each of this t uh, 12.5 25 75 will refer to the area of the flask base in unit centimeter square so now we'll move on to see uh, some of the useful numbers for cell culture so as we were discussing so your the flasks that we use uh, they come in different sizes the t25 t75 t160 so this might depend uh, this might differ depending on the company which is manufacturing it so uh, for uh, we also have the corresponding surface area and the seeding density for each of these flasks say for t25 flask the surface area is 2500 millimeter square so 2500 millimeter square is therefore a uh, 25 centimeter square the seeding density that is the number of cells that you need to uh, seed inside the t25 flask that is after one subculture event the number of cells that you will seed in a t25 flask is roughly about 0 0.7 into 10 to the power 6 uh, also the cells at conferences that is uh, the when you, the cells have uh, covered 100 percent of the area available to them that is uh, it has become 100 percent confluent uh, it will have roughly about 2.8 into 10 to the power 6 cells but again uh, these numbers are not uh, uh, absolute that is they might vary depending on the cell line that you're using so it, it is mentioned here that the number of cells on a confluent plate dish or flask will vary depending on the cell type so for this table hela cells were used so for other cells say if you have uh, one kind of cell which is say smaller in size then uh, those cells will have more number of cells at confluency compared to cells which are bigger in size so this numbers might vary so next thing is the uh, versine which is a uh, amount of versine that you must use so uh, versine is essentially a non-enzymatic uh, cell dissociating agent so uh, which is uh, added prior to trypsinizing your cells so this uh, versine we essentially uh, generally do not use in our lab so we'll skip this so next thing is the trypsin so how much amount of trypsin you need to add to dissociate your cells which are 100% uh, confident and growing in a t25 flask so uh, 3 ml of trypsin you can use sometimes we also uh, like in our lab we use uh, say about 1 to 1.5 ml of trypsin because uh, you know the amount of trypsin that you use say you use about 1 oh, 3 ml of trypsin then you also need will need uh, three times of that amount of uh, uh, trypsin to 
uh, of that amount of trypsin to uh, to uh, neutralize the cell that is you need three times uh, the amount of trypsin that is you need your uh, complete medium you need to add as much complete medium to trypsinize uh, to neutralize your cell so say you are using 3 ml of trypsin then you need to add 9 ml of uh, your complete medium to neutralize the trypsin after the cells have dissociated so we may, uh, we only use say about 1 to 1.5 ml of trypsin in our t25 flask so that we uh, need lesser amount of media that is uh, for 1 1 ml you can use 3 ml of media to uh, uh, neutralize the trypsin so the, these numbers might vary as long as the trypsin covers the entire surface of the flask then it is fine and then the growth medium so again uh, that is when you are seeding the cells in your t25 flask this is the amount of uh, growth medium that you need to add it is about 3 to 5 ml so we also have the corresponding numbers for your cell culture dishes that you use 35 mm 60 mm 100 mm and the culture plates that is 6 well 12 well and the 24 so this is an important table and when you are doing cell culture for yourself uh, you need to keep these numbers in mind uh, next we come to question number three so uh, question number three is to ensure carbon dioxide exchange in t20 flask close it tightly while in the incubator leave it slightly open while in incubator leave it fully open in the incubator or none of the above so you have four options here uh, how do you ensure that carbon dioxide exchange is taking place in your t20 flask so uh, do you close it tightly while placed in an incubator do you leave it slightly open or you leave it fully open or option d none of the above so you can write your answers in the chat box and we'll see what the right answer is Okay, so uh, as we had seen in the previous question that the T20 flask uh, comprises a uh, is uh, comprises a container with a flask, uh, container say a flask with a cap. So the cap, uh, it is asked here whether you should keep the cap slightly open, fully open, or close it tightly. So now that will depend on what your flask cap look like looks like. So uh, previously what we used uh, is uh, non vented caps so uh, but now we use vented caps so how how does this vented cap differ from the non vented caps so a uh, vented cap essentially has a has perforations in the cap itself which is covered with the help of a hydrophobic membrane so for the vented caps what you can do you can close the uh, cap tightly and you can still ensure that carbon dioxide exchange is taking place between the cells and the and the uh, outside carbon dioxide so uh, for the vented caps the uh, perforations will ensure that carbon dioxide uh, is going inside the in going inside the flask and exchange is taking place however there will be minimum risk of contamination uh, but for the non-vented caps that we use, non-vented flasks that we use, the caps will not be vented there. And for only those kind of flasks, you need to keep the cap slightly open to ensure carbon dioxide exchange. Uh, so this is how a vented cap looks like. So the non-vented cap, uh, if you uh, are, are with, devoid of any such perforation, and uh, for th only for those kind of flasks, you need to keep the cap slightly open. So this is how a vented cap will look like. So uh, th there are uh, pores inside uh, this cap, and then we have uh, we have this covered with the help of a hydrophobic membrane. So this will allow gaseous exchange while minimizing the risk of contamination. Now moving on to question number four. So a uh, matrigel coating is done prior to cell plating. What is matrigel? It is a is it a cleaning agent? Is it uh, a extracellular matrix or antibacterial coating or cell suspension? So, uh, what does matrigel refer to? Is it uh, a cleaning agent, an extracellular matrix 
antibacterial coating or cell suspension. So, a couple of you are saying that it should be answer B, that is extracellular matrix. Now, let's see what the right answer is and what matrigen refers to. So, the right answer is extracellular matrix and uh, this is what a uh, matrigen will look like. Uh, this comes in this, uh, this is a, uh, this, this matrigel will look like this. It will come in a bottle like this. And we'll discuss what matrigel is and, it, and its various uses. So the matrigel is a basement membrane matrix in extracted from Engelbreth, home, swarm, mouse, sarcoma, and it's used for a number of cell culture applications. So the primary components of the matrigel are four major basement membrane or ECM proteins, that is laminin, collagen 4, intactin, and the heparin sulfate proteoglycan perlecan. So these are the four essential basement membrane ECM components or proteins which are present in the matrigel. And it closely resembles the complex extracellular environment of the basement membrane and is used for cell culturing model systems, particularly for evaluating angiogenesis and cellular differentiation. So this is how normally inside your body the extracellular matrix looks like. So these are your cells and your cells are seated on a on a basement membrane and underlying the basement membrane we have the extracellular matrix. So uh, this condition or uh, this uh, uh, environment for the cells is mimicked by the matrigel in our cell culture and it is composed of uh, four major cell culture ECM proteins which is laminin, collagen 4, intactin and perlecan. So how does this function? So, uh, the and its uses. So, many cell lines and primary cells tend to adopt a more differentiated phenotype on matrigel, which is evident by their morphology and gene expression instead of continuing proliferation. So, and cancer cells which proliferate rapidly on matrigel and um, are able to invade into the gel and reenact the in vivo character of malignancy in vitro. So, uh, this uh, matrigel helps cancer cells, which are uh, cancer cells, to invade into the underlying extracellular matrix or uh, the basement membrane. So this is an essential property of cancer cells as you might already know that it has invasive property. So uh, when grown in media containing matrigel, uh, cancer cells uh, will mimic their in vivo uh, character of malignancy and will invade into the gel. Also when cancer cells are injected into mice along with mat matrigel, the frequency of tumor formation and their growth rate will be higher than those observed when cancer cells when injected alone. So matrigel is also used as a substrate instead of feeder cells for maintaining stemness or enhancing differentiation of embryonic stem cells and induced pluripotential stem cells. So these are few of the uses that we have enlisted uh, about matrigel. Now we'll see uh, how we use matrigel. So uh, matrigel comes in a uh, like as I showed you, it comes in a bottle and you need to reconstitute it. And after reconstitution, it will undergo gelation at temperature 22 to 37 degrees centigrade, uh, during which the intactin, which is one of the protein present in it, will, it will act as a cross-linker between laminin and collagen 4 to form a hydrogel. Now we will see how this thing happens. Okay, so uh, I have provided you with a video. To uh, see how this thing happens. Uh, uh, so, this video is uh, not playing at the moment. So, uh, when I provide you the link to the YouTube. Uh, video you will see how it functions so i have provided you with the link and you can see there how it uh, how ma how we use matrigel in our media now moving on to our next question that is question number 5 so if i want to conduct an experiment mimicking moon or space environment what should i use clinostat Weighing balance, thermometer, or fluorescence assisted cell sorter. So, uh, so we had discussed what a clinostat is. So, if I want to mimic uh, the moon or the space environment, which of the following uh, equipments we should use? So, as I was discussing, 
uh, during the introduction that uh, what a cleanostat is. So a cleanostat is used to simulate a microgravity condition. So one of you is saying the right answer should be cleanostat that is option A. Now let's see. So yes, the right option is cleanostat. So I have provided you with a video here of how it works. So uh, you can refer to it when I provide you with the link to the YouTube. So uh, I don't know if it will play. So I'm not playing it right now. So uh, the principle is that during cell rotation, that is uh, when the cells are rotated, it will uh, rotate continuously about the horizontal axis under the impact of a rotary device, uh, which will cell, uh, change the direction of the cells and the cells will constantly uh, the cells will constantly change the direction. In this field, the appropriate rotational speed and limited centrifugal force, the cells always exhibit a delayed response to the gravitational force, thereby simulating a microgravity environment. So, uh, sclenostat is used essentially to simulate a microgravity environment by rotating the cells in all direction. So, now moving on to the next question. Uh, question number six. Uh, MEMS or MEMS stands for macro electromechanical system, micro electromechanical system, micro electromagnetic system or macro electromagnetic system. So as we were discussing in the introduction about bio MEMS. So what does MEMS refer to? Is it macro electromechanical system, micro electromechanical system, micro electromagnetic system or macro electromagnetic system? Um, so, a uh, couple of you are saying it should be option B, that is microelectromechanical systems. So, let's see. So, it is option B and it is microelectromechanical system. So, uh, microelectromechanical system names uh, are also uh, sometimes uh, known as microfabricated devices, lab on chip, microsystems, or micro total analysis systems. So, you, these are used for the development of miniaturized diagnostic tools and high throughput screening assays for drug discovery and tissue engineering. This looks somewhat like this. It's a whole different field. Biomens is a growing field and we won't go much deep into it, but this is uh, somewhat what it looks like. So, this is a chip and it has all the essential components to function as a, as a self-sufficient uh, system. So, also this is also known as a lab on chip device and is used as miniaturized diagnostic tools or for high throughput screening assays. Next, we uh, move on to question number seven. Fluorescence occurs by the emission of electrical waves, magnetic waves, electromagnetic waves or none of the above. So, uh, you can write your answers in the chat box and we'll see what the correct option should be. Is it electrical waves, magnetic waves, electromagnetic waves or none of the above? Okay, so a couple of you are saying it, it is option C, that is electromagnetic waves. So we'll see what the right answer is. So the right option is indeed electromagnetic waves. So uh, fluorescence uh, is the process where a material will absorb light at high energy, short wavelength and emits light at a lower energy uh, and visible, usually visible wavelength. So we will see what the principle of fluorescence is. So, when light of a certain wavelength, that is the excitation wavelength, will hit a molecule, that is a fluorophore. So, uh, you, have a, uh, you have a fluorophore molecule where, which is excited by a certain wavelength of light. So, uh, what is uh, the principle here is um, high light, which is at higher energy, will have shorter wavelength. So, uh, your fluorophore molecules, are, uh, which are at the ground state, that is a, at a lower energy state, they are excited by light, which is at a higher energy uh, level and and at a shorter wavelength so it will absorb the light that is it will the photons will be absorbed by the electrons of the molecule and it from a ground state it will jump to an excited singlet state so in the excited singlet state it will have a higher uh, energy but however this excited singlet state is only uh, it will only uh, stay in this state for a short, very short amount of time. That is usually in the range of 10 to the power minus 9 to 10 to the power minus 
8 seconds so uh, after having been in this excited singed state for a short amount of time it will it will uh, emit some of its energy and will come to a uh, come to a lower energy state uh, so from this state uh, that is s1 dashed will come to the s1 state so uh, in this state uh, the, uh, when the when the electrons are in this state that is in the s1 state it will return to the ground state that is in that is the state that was previously in before it had before it had absorbed the energy and will return to the ground state and will lose the remaining amount of energy which was taken up during excitation as 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 a as a as in the form of longer wavelength of light so in the case of fluorophore the energy energy is emitted in the form of fluorescence emission of a longer wavelength with and therefore with less energy than the excitation light so this phenomenon is known as the stokes shift so what we need to keep in mind here is that light which is at higher energy will be of shorter wavelength is used to excite our fluorophore molecules which will then jump to a higher uh, which will jump to a higher energy level state and it will then give up some of its energy it will stay in that excited state for for a very short amount of time and will give up its energy to come to a lower energy level state and at this state it will give up the rest of the energy which was which is emitted in the form of fluorescence and it will come back to its ground state and this fluorescence is in the form of is in the form of longer wavelength of light so the absorbed uh, absorbed light is in the form of uh, shorter wavelength and the emitted light is in the form of fluorescence and longer wavelength so this is also the principle behind the functioning of a fluorescence microscope so this is uh, the layout of, a, of your fluorescence microscope this is how it works so this is an excitation light which will uh, which will, the excitation light is directed towards your dichroic mirror so we have a mirror here which is uh, here we, we call it the dichroic mirror 1 so the dichroic mirror it will only allow light below a certain wavelength to be reflected to the specimen and above a certain wavelength to be transmitted that will go it will uh, pass through this dichroic mirror but only light below a particular wavelength that is a shorter wavelength will be able to be reflected by the dichroic mirror to the specimen and then you have the specimen which is maybe coated with fluorophore molecules the specimen will again as i was uh, as we discussed in the previous slide that it will uh, it will absorb the energy it will move to a higher energy state and will then uh, lose some of its energy to come to a lower energy state and will it will uh, emit the rest of the energy as fluorescence so the fluorescence is light of longer wavelength and this will be directed towards the this so as i said the dichroic mirror it will only uh, uh, allow uh, that is it will allow light above a certain wavelength to be passed through so uh, pass through to since uh, so since uh, the light emitted by the specimen after excitation is of a longer wavelength this light will pass through this mirror it will hit this mirror so here we have two emission filters em1 and em2 which will block unwanted light and the fluorescence is then detected with the help of cameras or uh, PMTs or laser scanning. So for transmitted illumination of a bright field image, long wavelength light is selected. So this is the basic uh, 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 the basic uh, light path of a fluorescence microscope. So now we'll move on to our question number eight. Uh, so osmolarity is, uh, we have four options here, total number of solute particles per kg of solution, total number of solute particles per liter, moles per kg or number of moles so this uh, osmolarity we have discussed uh, in our introduction slide while recapitulating uh, the points so uh, you can write your answer in the chat box and then we'll see what the right answer is and what osmolarity refers to So uh, one of you is saying that it should be option B. That is, uh, osmolarity refers to the total number of solute particles per liter. So we'll see uh, what the right answer is. Indeed, total number of solute particles per liter. So um, you might have uh, seen this picture in your, uh, in, in your um, uh, say, when you were in school, say, in your 9th or 10th standard. So this is a picture that we have, we all have seen. So this is an animal cell. So say if it is placed in uh, if it is placed in a uh, solution which has a 
which is uh, which is which has uh, more number of solutes uh, present than uh, which is present inside it so we have uh, we have placed a particular cell inside a solvent which has a higher concentration of solute in that case the cell will shrink that is water will come out from the cell into the media and the cell will shrivel and if the cell is say placed in a in an environment or in a, a solvent where which has uh, say less number of solutes compared to uh, those present inside the cell then water will come inside the cell uh, so uh, in order to prevent this that is in order to uh, maintain your cells in the proper condition that is uh, uh, in order to prevent lysis or uh, or by bursting of the cells or prevent the cells from shrinking what we need to do is we need to maintain the correct osmolarity of our medium we need to culture the cells in the uh, right kind of osmolarity so like they like they are uh, like they are condition like they are subjected to inside the cell so this is a uh, very important thing that we need to keep in mind so uh, generally this is the range of uh, osmolarity for cell culture uh, 260 to 320 milli osmol so there are certain uh, cells which uh, require special osmolarity condition like uh, it was discussed in the lectures that uh, the neural cells will require slightly less uh, osmolarity so for for those cells we need to culture it in a specialized medium which will help to maintain the particular lower milli osmol or the lower osmolarity now moving on uh, question to question number nine uh, osmolarity is measured using uh, four options we have provided electrochemically freezing point depression weighing balance or immunocytochemistry so you can write the answer and we'll see the correct option is so how is osmolarity me uh, measured so earlier we discussed that uh, an osmometer is used to measure the osmolarity uh, so you take a particular aliquot of your medium and you measure the uh, osmolarity of that medium so uh, which of these factors will help us in measuring the osmolarity of a medium so uh, one of you is saying that it should be option b so let's see so yes option b is the right answer that is freezing point depression is used to measure osmolarity so uh, when solutes are introduced into a solvent the solution will differ from the initial solvent in several ways that is it will undergo certain changes in its colligative properties that is when you add solute to say uh, a particular uh, that is uh, say if you have water and you add solutes to it so it will undergo certain changes in these properties that is changes in its boiling point freezing point osmotic pressure and the vapor pressure so what are the changes that will will undergo so there will be a an elevation in its boiling point, depression of its freezing point, uh, elevation of its osmotic pressure, and depression of its vapor pressure. So uh, these are the uh, fact, uh, these are the properties that it will undergo a change in. And so freezing point is our freezing point depression is the right answer. Now the last question, question number ten. Uh, cell attachment can be promoted by treating the substrate with uh, cold trypsin warm trypsin polylysine or antibiotic so you can write the answer in the chat box and we'll see so as we have seen that we use trypsin to dissuade the cells from the surface of the culture flask or the culture plate so how can we promote cell attachment and uh, so definitely trypsin is not an option uh, either beat cold or warm so uh, antibiotic is uh, antibiotics are not used for the purpose of uh, promoting cell attachment antibiotic is used to prevent uh, the growth of fungus or bacterial contamination so that is the purpose of the antibiotic and it's not to promote cell attachment so the only option that we are left with is polylysine so a uh, couple of you are saying that the, the right answer should be polylysine so let's see so indeed polylysine is the right answer 
So it is a synthetic positively charged polymer and usually existing as two enantiomer, poly D lysine and poly L lysine. So adherence of specific cell types to poly lysine coated surface is based on the electrostatic interaction of the poly D lysine polycation with the negative charges of the cell membrane. So uh, uh, what we do is we uh, the cell uh, the for the adherent cells we have the uh, culture flasks or plates that are coated with the help of polylysine and what this polylysine does is that it will uh, promote the attachment of the cell which carries a negative charge to the surface of the to the surface of the culture flask or the culture plate because the polylysine will render a positive charge to the surface and therefore it will ensure that uh, the cells which carry a negative charge on the membrane will be attracted to the surface of the uh, flask or plate uh, by the help of electrostatic interaction and they will adhere to the flask or plate so polylysine is the right answer so that's all for uh, today's session so i would like to thank nptel and it madras for giving me this uh, opportunity of ta uh, i would also like to thank professor hoynak das the course instructor for this course i would like to express my gratitude to my supervisor professor mahitosh mandal sir I would also like to thank MHRD Government of India for the Prime Minister's Research Fellowship and IIT Kharagpur for allowing me to pursue uh, research at their institution. Lastly, I thank all your participants for joining the session and I look forward to your participation next in the coming weeks as well. Thank you. Now you may ask any questions that you might have in and I'll try to answer them. Thank you. So,